Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A Wild Mystery Podcast Appears, where we discuss mysteries, histories, and occasionally conspiracies. I'm your host, Belle. And I'm your co-host, Ollie. Just a quick disclaimer, uh, we are recording remotely, for, like away from each other for the first time over, because, drumroll please, <laughs> Chaboy got COVID. So, <laughs> <laughs> we we don't want, I don't want to give Belle COVID or Bell family COVID, or anybody <laughs> COVID. So, we're recording remotely. It might be weird. I might be coughing a lot. I'm fine, though. <laughs> it, the worst thing was I had a really bad sore throat, but it's gone. Yeah. And the other thing of that is that, so our recording setup has changed, obviously. Um, uh, Ollie has pets and I have pets, so we apologize for any background noise. In advance, we are doing the best that we can with the circumstances that we have. Um, so bear with us as we get started. Um, today, we are re- reviewing the case of Amelia Earhart. Today's content warnings are disappearances, uh, flying and plane crashes, and the like. So for those who don't know, Amelia Earhart was born on July 24th in 1897 in Atkinson, Kansas. She was an American aviation pioneer and author. She was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. During her life, she also set many other records, including the 1922 female, uh, feminine. Um, in 1922, she set the feminine altitude record of 14,000 feet. In 1928, she was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic as a passenger in the Fokker um, F-8 Friendship. Um, And in 1929 and 1930, she set the feminine speed record. She was also, um, in 1931, she was the first woman to fly an auto, um, uh, auto gyro, auto gyro. Um, gyro. Basically, it's auto gyro. So it's basically, for those who don't know, it's like the little one person, like helicopter looking things. And in that same year, she also set the auto, uh, altitude record in that at uh, 18,415 feet. In 1932, she was the first woman and only the second per- or, and the second person overall to fly solo and nonstop across the Atlantic. Um, she was also the first person to cross the Atlantic twice by air. Um, in 1932, she was the first woman to fly solo and nonstop across the U.S., And in 1933, she reset her transcontinental record. In 1935, she was the first person to fly solo from Honolulu, Hawaii, to the U.S. mainland um, in Oakland, California. In that same year, she also set the speed record between Mexico City and Washington, D.C. And was the first person to fly solo from Mexico City to Newark, New Jersey. Now, here's some early life for you. Interestingly enough, she didn't have an early love of aviation. When she was 10, she saw her first plane at a state fair, and she was not impressed. She said it was a thing of rusty wire and wood and looked not at all interesting. However, 10 years later, after she saw a stunt flying exhibition, she found her love for avionics. While standing in a clearing with her friend, the pilot performing, dove at them and swooped close by. She stood her ground. She had Good the for her. absolute balls. Um, in December um, of 1920, um, pilot Frank Hawks gave her a ride, and by the t- time they were a few hundred feet off the ground, she knew she had to fly. Becoming a female pilot in the 20s was no easy feat, though. She often defied conventional feminine behavior. When younger, she would climb trees, belly slam her sled to start it downhill, and hunted rats with a 22 rifle. She also maintained a scrapbook with clippings from newspapers, including excerpts of successful women in male-oriented fields. Sounds like she was very driven. (laughs) Very driven. I just... I can't say this enough. This is, like, (laughs) to give everybody a little bit of background, she is one of my favorite... Hold on, Bailey's drinking water. So we... Well, while Bailey's drinking water, I can talk... (laughs) So we, uh, we grew up in Alaska where there is a lot of aviation and I specifically, both my parents are, uh, aerospace engineers. So I know a lot about aviation and stuff. And growing up, Amelia Earhart was like a, 
and you know my mom being like the flaming feminist that she is <laughs> like Amelia Earhart was a big big uh inspiration she was always somebody that like we knew um so Amelia Earhart was always somebody that we looked up to as a family <laughs> and it was she you know also being in Alaska where there is a lot of aviation just in general it's somebody that we always knew a lot about but I don't think there was a lot of this stuff that I don't think I knew beforehand and you know and I I completely agree with you I mean growing up in Alaska I mean so much of our state is central to avionics just because well either you you have to get out to the communities one way or the other and that's either typically by boat or by plane and for me as a young woman in Alaska where there are very few instances in my life where I look back and go I okay that's not necessarily true there are a lot of points in my life where I look back and go hey I was treated differently because I'm a girl because I'm a woman absolutely yeah and being able to push past those boundaries and say no I'm just as good as a man I'm just as strong as a man if not stronger in some ways more than others you know there's nothing about me that falls behind just because of my gender identity and the sex that I was assigned at birth this isn't and seeing these, you know, early there's nothing women, that you can't do as a person. Yeah, and seeing these early women in fields that are still male dominated to this day, but were even more so back in the day. Like that's that's very inspiring <laughs> for people who absolutely, want, yeah, for women who want to be like, in my example, or in my case, I wanted to be a doctor. Ironically, health made that <laughs> not possible. But like, I'm still going into the medical field, and I think it is, and I. Th- you know, medicine has become one of those that I don't think is usually described as male dominated. Um, but aviation certainly still is. And my mom oh, had trouble. She had professors that she almost punched in the face. <laughs> but, you know. Queen. Yeah. And that's why Amelia Earhart and people like her are such massive inspirations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there was never where it's like, who do you look up to growing up? Like, what's a woman that you look up to? And I'd like instantly, it's like Amelia Earhart, without question. Um, uh, graduating from Hyde Park High School in 1915, she then attended Ogon's girl, a girls finishing school in Philadelphia. However, she left in the middle of her second year to work as a nurse's aide in a military hospital in Canada during World War One. Damn. She later attended college at Columbia, but she did not graduate. Then she became a social worker at Denison House in Boston, which provided social and educational services to neighborhood residents, most of whom were immigrants. Damn. Which, I mean, even at... Well, actually, I don't know. No, okay, yeah, we've always been pretty shit about immigrants in this country. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not the best. Um... Her first flight took place on January 3rd in 1921, and within six months, she was able to save up enough money to buy her first plane, which was a Kiner Airster, a bright yellow two-seater airplane named the Canary. This was a plane that she actually used to set her first woman's record by flying to an altitude of 14,000 feet. In 1928, after an interview in New York with some project coordinators, including book publisher and publicist George P. Putnam, she became the first female passenger to cross the Atlantic by airplane, accompanying pilot Wil- Wilmer Stoltz and the co-pilot slash mechanic um, Louis Gordon. The team left uh, Trepassey Harbor um, in Newfoundland, in Newfoundland um, in a Fokker F-7 named Friendship in June 1928 and arrived at Burryport, Wales approximately 21 hours later. It's a really long flight. Yeah. <laughs> this historic flight made headlines worldwide because three pilots had died within the year trying to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. When the crew returned to the United States, they were greeted with a ticker tape parade in New York and a reception held by President Coolidge at the White House. The fuck is a ticker tape parade? Uh, <clears throat> you know what? Good question. <laughs> also, this is the first time I've ever heard the name President Coolidge, so. <laughs> yeah. 
A ticker tape parade is an event held in a built-up urban setting allowing large amounts of shredded paper, originally actual ticker tape, but now mostly confetti. Uh, <laughs> confetti. <laughs> but now mostly confetti to be thrown from nearby office buildings onto the parade route, creating a celebratory effect by the snowstorm-like flurry. Okay, damn. Cool. Should they just tell people beforehand, hey, have your ticker tape ready? <laughs> You're going to go throw it at Amelia Earhart. Uh, from then on, her life revolved around flying. She placed third at the Cleveland Women's Air Derby, later nicknamed the Powder Puff Derby by Will Rogers, which, you know what, I'm sure he used that as an insult, but honestly, coin the phrase, ladies. Yeah, I, I would, I would, and I'm going to, uh, mm-hmm. claim that. Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. This is a powder puff derby, man. We own that shit. Um, and as fate would have it, George Putnam, the publicist from earlier, entered her life too. The two developed a friendship during preparation for the Atlantic crossing and were married on February 7th of 1931. Intent on retaining her independence, she referred to the marriage as a partnership with dual control. I love her. Love her. That's She's such like, an icon. And I mean, that's how a, that's how a marriage should be seen. But I think there are for nineteen thirty one. That's I mean, a really progressive thing. And I mean, even today, there are times when that is not how it is seen. <laughs> Ladies run. Correct. <laughs> if <laughs> yeah, no, it's it should absolutely be an equal partnership, and it's and I. <sighs> I'm not going to get into that. I was no, about we to can't. go into a whole, like, it's we not will... always 50-50, but I'm not going to spend 20 hours talking about we, that. We may go on several feminist rants in this episode, disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Together, they worked on a plan for her to be the first woman and the second pilot overall to fly solo over the Atlantic. So he was, in like, behind her. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. He is such a supporter for her, and I you love to see it i really yeah. do and god especially for the time it makes me so happy yeah. um i need to do an episode of Marie in, Curie. oh you do um in may 1932 she took off from harbor grace newfoundland piloting a lockheed vega 5b and made her first non-stop solo transatlantic flight her flight wasn't easy and she faced strong north winds mechanical issues and icy conditions as a result of the successful flight, she was honored by President Hoover with the United States Distinguished Flying Cross, as Finally, she should have. A president that I have heard of. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> she said that she felt the flight proved that men and women were equal in jobs requiring intelligence, coordination, speed, coolness, and willpower. Um, and I bet nobody yeah. called that a power puff derby. <laughs> Just her, like... Yeah, exactly. And I mean... ha like okay so right now commercial planes are made to take a lot of strong weather Beatings. like yeah you're you're if you're in a jet engine flying over the atlantic you can get hit by lightning and your plane will be fine <laughs> like you like your pilots may be shaken be but you will be fine <laughs> um yeah and like you know engines won't start unless or it won't stop i mean Unless, like, you know, something goes wrong. There's something wrong with the plane and you shouldn't have taken off in the first place. But, like, back in the day, this was, like... Okay, hold on. That was when uh, the Wright brothers, very th their very first, like... I, I think it was, like, a 30-second flight. <laughs> so... Yeah, 1903. So From this 1931 was... 1931 to 1903. This or, was... 1932 to 1903. About this 30 was years later. years later. 29 yeah. yeah so it wasn't that much you know for um you know strong winds mechanical issues and well strong winds and icy conditions <laughs> those are things that uh -huh. i think you expect to have to deal with if you are piloting stuff but it's still like rough and it was solo right yeah so yeah so she's like that's very uh resourceful of her <laughs> mm-hmm I think there were probably men at the time who couldn't have done that. 
Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, and she was the second person overall to do it. I mean, three people died trying to do it that that year. And so she, you know, so, yeah, just an incredible woman. Powerful woman. Very strong. In 1935, she became a visiting faculty member at, Por- at Purdue University as an advisor to aeronautical engineering and a career counselor to female students. She was also a member of the National Women's Party and an early supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment. Good she for just, her. She can't get more awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... <clears throat> Another one of her accomplishments and a legacy was that she was instrumental in the formation of the 99s, which is an international organiza- organization for women's pilots. On November 2nd in 1929, the organization was founded at Curtis Field by 26 licensed female pilots for the mutual support and advancement of women pilots. At the suggestion of Amelia Earhart, the organization's name was taken from the number of charter members, eventually settling on the 99s. In 1931, she was elected as their first president, and the organization has continued to make a significant impact by supporting the advancement of women in aviation since, since its inception. Yeah, and there, she, are, mm-hmm. there are a lot of, like, women in aviation uh, organizations now. that yeah that have been formed now, and a lot of them, I'm sure, were probably uh, inspired by the 99s. Oh, I'm, I'm sure... She was one of the most inspirational American figures in aviation from the li- from the late 1920s throughout the 1930s. Her legacy is often compared to the early aeronautical career of pioneer aviator Charles Lindenberg, as well as to figures like First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who was close friends with Amelia, and their lasting impact on the issue of women's causes from that age. Well, Ollie... Now that you know more about Amelia Earhart, her history, and her stance on many things, what do you think? Did you learn anything new? I definitely did learn a lot of new stuff. Like, Amelia Earhart is one of those figures that I always looked up to as a kid, but it's not like... One of those people that you just don't, like, look into more as an adult. You just kind of, like, I know things about Amelia Earhart, you know? (laughs) I'm still, by the way, very disappointed... Like, do you know how crushed I was as a child to realize her name was not spelled A I R H E A R T? <laughs> like, I was yeah, like, what? I, I remember being so affronted when I learned that. <laughs> not that she can help it, but I was like, wait, yeah, no, <laughs> it's not correct. Also, can we just appreciate? As far as I know, she did not change her name after she got married. Or yeah, I don't think what was because there's her? there's nothing that ever refers to her as Amelia Putnam. Yeah, which doesn't sound as good to be fair. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's especially when it's coming from, you know, she's an aviator, and whether or not it's spelled like Earhart, it's because it's not. Yeah, it sounds like it could be, and it kind of leads to the. Uh, you know, I think it's just a really cool thing. On June 1st, Amelia and her navigator Fred Noonan departed from Miami and began the 29,000 mile journey. By June 29th, when they had landed in Lay, New Guinea, they only had 7,000 miles left. Okay. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's pretty sweet. In a month. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> at this stretch in the flight, um, Noonan was having a difficult time because of frequently inaccurate maps. Well, I mean, it's not like they could exactly just pull up a satellite image like yeah, we have that would now. Be, that would be annoying, though. Yeah. Um, their next stretch, which was fr- from Lay to Howland Island, was the most challenging stretch of the journey, located over 2,500 miles away in the mid-Pacific. The island was only a mile and a half long and a mile and a, and a half a mile wide. Very tiny spot to hit in a big ass ocean and he had inaccurate maps and it, yeah exactly and inaccurate maps <sighs> um every unessential item that could be 
removed was to make room for as much extra fuel as possible. She also had the aid of the Coast Guard cutter ITA CSA Atasca, I'm going to call it. I don't know if that's actually what it's called, but I'm calling it Atasca. I've heard, as the I've radio heard it referred contact... to as the Ita- Oh, did I? Yay! I've heard it referred what? to as the Itasca, so <laughs> you're not the only one. Itasca. Yeah. Sweet! Because <laughs> um, I'm not spelling that every single time. Um, so the Itasca was their radio contact, and they also had several other U.S. ships to help light the way to Howland Island, as that small of an island could be incredibly difficult to spot. Um, so on July 2nd at 10 a.m. local time in Lay, um, they took off. And despite favorable, favorable weather reports, they encountered overcast skies and occasional rain showers. Now, Noonan prefer- preferred celestial navigation, and the inclement weather made this type of navigation quite difficult. Now, this next part is taken directly from the biography on her website. As dawn neared, Earhart called the Itasca, reporting, cloudy weather, cloudy. In later transmissions, she asked the Itasca to take bearings on her. The Itasca sent her a steady stream of transmissions, but she could not hear them. Her radio transmissions, irregular through most of the flight, were faint or interrupted with static. At 7.42 a.m., the Itasca picked up the message, we must be on you, but we cannot see you. Fuel is running low. Been able to re- uh, been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at one thousand feet. Oh, that's low. Planes seem not to hear what. That's really low. One thousand yeah, feet. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. For reference, hmm? hold on. So, a commercial jet. If you've ever flown in a jet, they usually fly at about thirty-six thousand feet. So. <laughs> And her record was at 14,000 feet, I think you said? Uh, her, that was the first record that she set. Yeah. Um, and then she later went to 18,000 like... in the auto gyro. Auto gyro. Auto gyro. That's less than a mile. A mile is yeah. um, 5,280 feet. So that's like, mm-hmm. it's like a fifth of a mile. <laughs> that's very, very yeah, low. Yeah, from- the water ocean yeah thank you um the ship tried to reply but the plane seemed not to hear and at 8 45 a.m Earhart reported we are running north and south nothing further was heard from her so when i was writing this up i don't know why but like and part of the reason i took it directly from her the bibliography on her website is because when I read that, I don't know, it just made me feel like, I I got very, like, emotional reading that, and I wasn't quite sure why, but I was just like, it's like, okay, I think I need to include that. Yeah, you get a, you get a really good idea of what was going on, the people that were trying to help her, and I mean, yeah. there are things like, if she was saying she was flying at a thousand feet, that feels to me... I'm not a pilot, but that feels to me it's like, like she, it almost feels like a desperation. That that's so low. I feel like that is either she is saying we are running out of fuel and this is as high as we can go, or she's saying I know that we should be around where we are, but we can't find it, so we're flying low to try and see. Yeah. Yeah. I just it's it feels like a very like last desperate act yeah you know now i do want to clarify something because when i was drafting this up i actually got really confused and um i actually had to do a lot of investigation into this because i was very confused by this statement because they actually crossed the international date line so they departed from lay on july 22nd and flew for roughly 20 hours so, during this flight, they crossed two di- time zones, so they were supposed to arrive on July 2nd because of the international date line. So, when I read that the first time, I was like, so they departed on July 2nd and flew 2,500 miles and then arrived at... On the second, Then were okay. supposed to arrive. Yeah, I was like, what okay, the that hell? Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it, it confused me so bad. I sat there for like 10 minutes going, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> Because, I mean, so, yeah, okay. 
Yeah, it was very confusing. Um, from there, the most extensive air and sea search in naval history occurred. For 17 days, they searched for the team, or uh, for Fred and Amelia Earhart. A total of $4 million was spent, and over 250,000 square miles of ocean were searched. Um, unfortunately, after the 17th day, they uh, reluctantly had to call the search off. Now, here's where we get into the more speculative parts. So, what do you... Th- what? Before we go into kind of any of the, like, more, like, the theories that have come out by other people, kind of, what are the theories that you have about her disappearance? I mean, for me, um, just Occam's razor, she probably, they probably ran out of fuel, ended up in the ocean, and died that way, or just never found. Although, some of the stuff that you're going to get into with, um, what island is it? that the island with all the crabs the <laughs> um, um Gar- gardner island yeah that's pretty convincing to me too that they might have ended up on gardner island um mm-hmm. but again occam's razor with a lot of this shit <laughs> yeah actually i'd be really interested to know what my parents think about this <laughs> yeah do you want to explain occam's razor to people who might not know what that is the simplest solution is often the correct one. Uh, and to me, the simplest solution is they probably just ran out of fuel and ended up dying in the ocean and just were never found. It's not like they had a black box that would have been um, like bleeping out their location Trans or anything. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have a transponder or anything like that. So I think it is more likely to me that the plane would have never been found in 1932 than today. Uh, in 1937. Okay. That's not too far off, though. I was just, I was like, I was like, wait a second. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I don't know where I got 1932 from. Oh, it was the other thing that she did. earlier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. One of the other, you know, wonderful achievements that she accomplished. Um, now, um, and so personally, I, I think that there's a lot of, you know, speculation about what happened and no idea has ever swayed me more than others. I think that, you know, they potentially could have gone off course. Um, you know, I think that, I, I do also think that the Gardner Island theory is compelling, but not resolute. And I, with how deep and vast that the ocean is, I wouldn't be surprised if they had crash landed and their plane was just never able to be recovered, which I hate that theory because I would like to think that someday someone will find it. But the ocean is so vast that it's like, is that possible? Um, so with that being said, some of the main prevailing theories, um, some have suggested that Amelia and, um, Noonan survived and landed elsewhere, but were either never found or that they were killed, making on route locations like Tarawa, um, unlikely. Proposals have included the uninhabited Gardner Gardner Island, 400 miles from the vicinity of Howland, um, um, the Japanese-controlled Marshall Islands, which was 870 miles at the closest point of Mili Atoll, and the Japanese-controlled Northern Mariana Islands, which were 2,700 miles from Howland. Um, I don't know who came up with that theory, but they'd have to be pretty far off and not, and because I don't think that would be in transmission range. (laughs) Just saying. And Um, uh, Gardner Island, was that where the skeleton was discovered? I'm going to get into that. that. Okay. (laughs) Um, So many researchers believe that um, she and Noonan ran out of fuel while searching for Howland Island, ditched at sea, and unfortunately died. Um, The plane would have carried enough um, fuel to reach Howland. Mm -hmm. By the way, just aviation um, terminology, ditched means crashed. (laughs) 
It's just a oh yeah, a polite way to say ditched or t- to say crashed. Yes, yeah, very polite way to say it. Um, the plane would have carried enough fuel to reach Howland with some extra to spare. The extra fuel would cover some contingencies such as headwinds and the search for Howland. Um, the plane could fly a compass course towards Howland through the night. In the morning, the time of apparent sunrise would allow the plane to determine its line of position. From that line, the plane could determine how much farther it must travel before reaching a parallel sun line that ran through Howland. At 6.14 a.m., a task of time, Earhart estimated they were 200 miles away from Howland. As the plane closed with the island, it expected to be in radio contact with Itasca. With the radio contact, the plane should have been able to use radio direction finding, RDF, to head directly for the Itasca and Howland. The plane was not receiving a radio signal from the Itasca, so it would have been unable to determine a respective RDF bearing. So, although the Itasca... Mm -hmm. Do you know if it was cloudy this whole time? Um, I believe it was because they said it was like a uh, cloudy weather. Cloudy was that yeah. transition? Because I can and see that, um, that I understand. One was, that one was at dawn. Yeah, I can understand why um, Fred Noonan would have preferred celestial navigation, especially with um. Inaccurate masks. Yeah, it's masks. <laughs> Inaccurate maps. But if it was cloudy mm-hmm. the whole time, that maybe he was, they were trying to go off inaccurate maps and it was just making everything worse. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, especially if you're, like, out in the middle of the fucking ocean, what kind of landmarks are you going to use, you know? <laughs> um, although Atasca was re- receiving HF radio signals from the plane, it did not have HF RDF equipment, so it could not determine a bearing to the plane. Almost no communications were transmitted to the plane. Um, consequently, the plane was not directed to Howland. It was left on its own with little fuel. Presumably, the plane reached the parallel sun and started searching for Howland on that line of position. And at 7.42 a.m., Earhart reported, We must be on you, but cannot see you, but gas is running low. Have un- been a or have been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at 1,000 feet. And then an hour later, the issue reported, we are on the line 157337. We will, pre- we will repeat this message. We will repeat this on 6210 kilocycles. Wait. And between the low on fuel message at 742 and her last confirmed message at 843, her signal strength remained constant, or, or excuse me, consistent, indicating that she never left the immediate Howland area as she ran out of fuel. The U.S. Coast Guard made this determination by tracking her signal strength as she approached the island, noting signal level, levels from her reports of 200 and 100 miles out. These reports were roughly 30 minutes apart, providing vital ground speed clues. Based on these facts and the lack of additional signals told from Earhart, the Coast Guard first responders initiating the search concluded that she ran out of fuel somewhere very close to and north of Howland. So is that 200 and 100 miles out from Howland? Yeah. Okay. Now, kind of continuing on some of the other theories, um, including Gardner Island, um, there's also a theory that they were captured by the Japanese, um, and there's also been some even more extreme theories, including that Amelia was spying on the Japanese on orders from Franklin Roosevelt um, from FDR. There was also a claim that Amelia was doing propaganda broadcasts for Tokyo Rose. Um, now, Tokyo Rose was, I mean, I don't know how to put it other than basically how it was stated Tokyo Rose was basically like this radio broadcasting where you had several women who were um, announcing uh, well propaganda over the radio Um, now her husband George Putnam investigated these claims personally and listened to numerous audios and he didn't recognize his wife's voice in in any of the audio Um, there was also a theory that she had survived the flight moved to New Jersey and assumed another name and remarried. That woman's name and life were thoroughly investigated and she is not Amelia. And I'm not going to name her here because she's already like, yeah, like I, gone through the ringer on this. Like people were straight up badgering this woman. It's insane. I don't find that theory very convincing. <laughs> 
I don't either. <laughs> um, now, a lot of this next part in terms of the most recent updates on Amelia's disappearance is a lot of this is taken directly from her website and because there's really not another great resource out there for all of that that I think wrapped up the information quite as nicely. So I'm going to do my best to summarize so it's not as extensive, but it is very, um, there's a lot of information and a lot of like, uh, you'll see as I get into it. There was a partial skeleton of a castaway found in the 1940s on the Pacific island of Nikumaro. Nikum, oh my god. Nikumaro? Nikumaro. Um, shows some similarities um, to Amelia Earhart. Now, though um, there have been many extensive searches, they failed to turn the bones. Scientists have found a record of those bones measurements, which were taken by a British doctor in 1941. So, according to Richard Gillespie, um, he says that the measurements match up with um, Amelia's build. Um, and he is the executive director of the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery called um, Tiger, um, which launched a project to piece together her disappearance in 1988. And he is quoted, or one of the representatives from Tiger is quoted as saying, the match does not, of course, prove that the castaway was Amelia Earhart, but it is a significant new data point that tips the scales further in that direction. Um, however, a... Um, you... Go ahead. You don't know how far away... Nikumarora was from Howland Island, do you? I had looked it up and I don't remember it, but give me, if you give me a second, I can look. So, yeah, because I'm just, I'm thinking like, if the Coast Guard is pretty sure she disappeared like about 100 miles north of Howland Island, north ish of Howland Island, and Nikumaroro is about 100 miles north ish of Howland Island, like that's pretty fucking convincing, you know? Yeah. But then, like, why wouldn't they've searched. Nakumaroro. <laughs> yeah. If it was that close. Also quick, like, while you're doing that, like, the government and especially aviation is super, super fucking into acronyms, <laughs> as I'm sure you can notice, and most of them are pronounceable. Like, uh, the, my, my best example that I am most familiar with is the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, which is a union. Um, it's always like I have always heard it referred to as Natka. <laughs> yeah. So same. Most of this shit is like is going to be most of this um these acronyms, if you're sitting there wondering like, do they really pronounce it? Yes. Yes they do. <laughs> I'm not that far off, I promise. Okay. So because Ollie asks such magnificent questions, we had to take a break for a second Thank you. so I could do some math. Um because for some reason it wouldn't let me just like search the distance between um Niku oh my god help Nikumuroro um, in Howland Island yes so I had to actually use the little scale on a map and do the math um so Nikumuroro and Howland Island are were roughly 341 miles apart if I did my math right <laughs> <laughs> which to be fair like that's not using like it's not that outrageous because no. if you think about it in the ditch it... they would have had emergency supplies and in theory they would have had a raft and they could have floated to Nikumuroro well and that 100 miles that uh that the coast guard calculated that was that from one of their transmissions? It, could have been wrong. it was from numerous transmissions. So from the okay. um, constant transmissions that they did, it was basically just oh, like right. Yeah, it was like a culmination of data. And also, you can't say how accurate they were back then. So that I think correct that is potentially possible. And you don't know was the Kumaroro to the north of Howlin Island or? Based on the map that I looked at, it was, like, to the south... Never eat sour east? worms. <laughs> right. Okay. I was doing the exact <laughs> same thing. Uh, oh, the things that stick with us. Yeah. Crazy. 
Um, yes, it was slightly to the southwest. Um, so in theory, I think it's I think it's a compelling theory. Now, with this being said, though, um, a forensic anthropologist whose name is Anne Ross, who's not entire uh, not involved with the Tiger study said that she believes that the methodology methodology used by Tiger is not re- reliable. She um, She's the director of Forensic Science in- Sciences Institute at um, North Carolina State University. She's unsure that the doctor's notes are even real because of the um, anomalous language in the writing. Now, um, since 1988, Gillespie, who's the doctor or who's the guy who originally came up with this theory, um, has led Tiger researchers on 11 expeditions in an effort to piece together what he calls a jigsaw puzzle of clues to reveal the true story of what happened to Amelia Earhart. Um, They've been looking into the possibility that they might have been on an emergency landing on Nikimororo, now called Gardner Island, in the Republic of Kiribati, where they may have subsequently perished. Um... Now, uh, up until this point, her plane has also still remained missing. Like, they haven't found, um, they haven't found it. Um, in 2014, though, Tiger researchers found an anomaly on the seafloor off of Nikimororo that they said needed closer examination. Okay. Now, in the late 1990s, World War II historian Peter McQuarrie stumbled upon a file in the National Archives in Kiribati titled Discovery of Human Remains on Gardner Island, according to a Tiger report. The file contained correspondences between the British administrator of Nikimororo and British officials from 1940 and 1941. The documents note that a partial human skeleton badly damaged by coconut crabs had been discovered on the island in 1940, alongside the remains of birds, a turtle, and a campfire. Artifacts found with the bones included the sole of a shoe thought to belong to a woman, a a Benedictine liquor bottle, and a box that held a nautical navigation device, which was called a sextant. Um, The box would have contained the same type of sextant uh, that Noonan is said to have used as a backup navigational device, um, he told Live Science, um, which is a... um, uh, online um magazine if you will um the documents also included the report or the documents also included the report by dr dw hoodless who examined the bodies in suva fiji and declared that they belonged to a european male who was about five foot six inches which would have been much shorter than Earhart, who stood five foot nine according to an npr report from- that's not that much shorter now in 1998 around the time the documents were found forensic anthropologists karen burns and richard jance suggested that the morphology of the recovered bones insofar as we can tell by applying contemporary forensic methods to measurements taken at the time, appears consistent with a female of Earhart's height and ethnic origin, according to the Tiger Statement. Now, a new analysis of the records and measurements using a a photograph of Earhart suggests arm bone similarities with the aviator. Um, Jeff Glickman, who is a forensic examiner who found a forensic image processing lab called Fotec looks specifically at the ratio of the radius of the lower arm bone, um, or excuse me, at the ratio of the radius, which is the lower arm bone to the humerus, which is the upper arm bone, and that this document put the castaway's humerus at 32.4 centimeters, which is 12.8 inches long, and the radius at 9.6 inches. The resulting radius to humerus ratio would be 0.756, or a so-called brachial index of 75.6. Now, that number would be statistically expected for an average woman born in the late 19th century, according to Tiger. Another possibility was that the castaway was a woman who had unusually long forearms for the time period. And Jans had wondered if Earhart did have similarly longer than average forearms, which... I fall into that category as well. My forearms are super long and I don't know why. Um, to try and find out the answer to that question, they uh, found a bare armed photograph of Amelia and identified the correct points on the shoulder, elbow, and wrist to give them the most accurate locations um, of the ends of her humerus and radius. And the results suggest that her ratio would have been 0.76 
a match that's consistent with a castaway. Now, it's kind of hard to determine that because obviously you're looking at a photo, which likely has some distortion. And then on top of that, you're also dealing with, well, you have the bone, but when it's on your body, you have musculature, um, ligaments, you have a lot of stuff in the way to get in the way of those actual measurements. I mean, yeah, we have um, all the stuff that you can't necessarily um, calculate what a person's actual measurements are going to be based on their bones. I think we have better technology to be able to estimate, but it is never... A guarantee. It's never like, yeah, <laughs> it's never like definitive. And I'm also, the fact that this is all coming from the same people is, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> is, yeah, uh, you know, that it's not like, being corroborated. If it, if this is all true, it's very convincing, but the fact that it is being filtered through Tiger exclusively Mm -hmm. yes is (laughs) i would agree i would agree from there um they go on to say that about 20 percent of american women might have had arms fitting that ratio so it's uncommon but not rare for that index to occur um calculating that it might be her is a more difficult question because that would depend on what other uh, because of what other possibilities have to be considered Um, and then he um, Jance goes on to say that all I would say at the moment is that it strengthens the circumstantial case Um, but Ann Ross said she sees several problems with the methods used to come up with the arm bone ratio as well as the doctor's notes um Now, uh, she goes on to say that the lengths of the arm bones are more in line with the typical measurements for a male. Um, Part of the castaway's pubic bone was also found, according to the doctor's notes. Measurements of that bone, including the so-called subpubic angle, also suggested male bones, according to Ross. We only know what the doctor said he did, Jant said. He used three three criteria for sex, two of which are unreliable. The third subcubic angle is fairly reliable but not foolproof but not foolproof since the doctor was not an experienced forensic anthropologist and we do and we do not know what weight he assigned to the three criteria there seems no reason to trust his sex estimate in addition a review of tiger's 1998 analysis also points to the bones belonging to a male Without access to the missing original bones it is impossible to be definitive but on balance the most robust scientific analysis and conclusions are those of, of the original British finding indicating that the Nikamuroro bones belong to a robust middle-aged man, not Amelia Earhart, Pamela Cross, an archaeologist at the University of Bradford in the UK, um, and Richard Wright, an emeritus professor of anthropology at the University of Sydney, wrote in September 2015 in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports. Um, and continuing on that, um, Ross said that there, uh, that the doctor's notes show even more, cons- in, more inconsistencies with the time period. Um, in the handwritten notes attributed to Hoodless, it says it could be that of a short, stocky, muscular European, or even a half case, or a person of mixed European descent. Ross mentioned that the anthropologist and others didn't refer to anyone in this language in 1941. And instead, they would have said the bones belong to a Caucasoid, Negroid, or mono, Mongoloid. Mongoloid. Mongoloid? I think Mongoloid. <laughs> yeah. Um, if the bones and doctor's notes are verified, whomever the bones belong to seemed to have survived for some time on that island. Um, based on other artifacts found on the island, she, you know, in... Gillespie's pretty sure that this is Amelia Earhart, so he's so he says in his quote of the thing, she doesn't know where she is and she has to survive the best she can. Looks like she did manage to survive to catch rainwater and boil it for drinking water. He told Life Science in an interview, adding that this castaway also probably caught little fish and birds. Um, he thinks that the bones strongly point to belonging to Amelia Earhart. Um, 
he says castaways are really rare in the Pacific and female castaways even more so. Try to remember this is a while ago. This is in the 80s. So he's kind of being a little sexist, I think, in my opinion. <clears throat> but for the time range, I can see why he would be like, female castaways aren't that common because, well, there's not very women who would be getting themselves into quote unquote situations where they would end up as a castaway. But I still think that's kind of like a naive concept. And then he goes on to say that this castaway had things with her that date from the early to mid 1930s and we have good records, you know? So with that being said, those are kind of the prevailing theories as to what happened to Amelia Earhart. So with all of that information, did we change your, or did I change your mind on anything or do you still think that Gardner Island is still probably the most compelling theory? Um, do you think it's possible that she survived? And if not, why do you think we haven't found the remains of her plane yet? Or her? Um, <sighs> I feel about the same, honestly. Um, honestly, I'm feeling less convinced about... The, the Gardner, Gardner Island, Island theory after all of this. My, mainly because of what I said, like just it all being the same source. But <sighs> I mean, this is just like hard if, to say. It, <clears throat> if this information was corroborated from another source, I would feel that it was very compelling. But it's not. So Yeah. The fact that they have led eleven exhibitions into that area. And so they're saying, okay, cool. So this doc this British doctor from nineteen forty one, which was two years after her disappearance. Yeah. After she went missing. And <clears throat> so I mean And to not note, like, the level of decomposition of the bones in mm -hmm. this so-called thing. And they're saying, okay, cool, we took the bones to Fiji, and they were an, um, analyzed in Fiji. You're telling me that no one kept track of them after they did yeah. the analysis on them? I just think it's really weird. A little sus. Just gonna leave it at that. Well, because, like, I mean, even if, I, even if yeah. it was not Amelia Earhart, that is still a, a person... And especially if exactly. they thought it was a man, why wouldn't they think that they were worth identifying or at least hanging on to? Exactly. It just, it's, it, to me, it doesn't make like a lot of sense. I'm definitely on the viewpoint of where I truly don't, I don't think that there's like any propaganda. I don't think she was spying for anybody. I think it was just a misfortunate no. accident and Occam's you know razor. whether maybe she landed on an island somewhere there maybe they ditched and also i just want to point out so they're saying that oh yeah there's this like blip that we wanted to check out that was in 2014 it's 2022 yeah you would have think you would think that they would have investigated that more by now by yeah i mean this is one of those things where it's i really want to see this one like solved in my lifetime because because she is such an influential piece of like shaping me as I am as an adult or as like a, as a child as an adult just shaping who I am as a person yeah I but would then it's also just kind of like, what happened if what I am thinking is correct it probably won't be solved probably because not. you know if she's just in in the ocean somewhere it's hard to say yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. um so but i do want to go ahead and add that her legacy lives on so much farther beyond where like just who she was as a person um she still she has numerous scholarships that are given out in her name yearly and you know how much she's done for aviators and female aviators her legacy absolutely lives on so while she might 
have disappeared, she is still making waves for women and aviators around the world. And she Mm -hmm. will always be remembered as one of the most influential women um, to have ever lived. Thanks for listening to today's episode of A Wild Mystery Podcast Appears. This has been the review of Amelia Earhart, an amazing woman who disappeared on her flight around the world. Maybe one day, this mystery can be put to rest. I'm Belle. And I'm Molly. Thanks for listening to today's episode of A Wild Mystery Podcast Appears. Don't forget to check out our Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, where we post additional resources after every episode. You can also find all of that information on our website at awmpa.com. We hope to see you next week and stay safe.